This webinar is brought to you by the Government of Denmark, by the International Energy Agency, the IEA, and by my organization, the IISD, International Institute for Sustainable Development. Um, we're a not-for-profit um, policy research institute, and I'm the senior director for the energy program, which covers our work under our global subsidies initiative and also our work on energy transition. So hopefully very relevant to today's webinar. Um, the event is in the context of the Global Commission on People-Centered Clean Energy Transitions. And it's very, we, we're really delighted to have this opportunity to talk today about the role of fossil fuel subsidies within that um, those clean energy transitions which need to be people centred. And I think we already know quite a lot about fossil fuel subsidies and their relationship to clean energy transitions. We know the impacts of fossil fuel subsidies that they are costing governments around the world 500 billion US dollars or more per year, that their reform could lead to a reduction in greenhouse gases of at least 6%, so a very significant potential role to play towards meeting the Paris targets, that they lead to overconsumption, so uh, air pollution and other impacts like that. We'll hear more on the health side today, which really pleased to have representative from the World Health Organization with us. And we know that um, they're not particularly equitable, that a lot of the benefits of subsidies go to the richer parts of society and to the richer parts of the economy. Um, we also, I think, we, we know a lot more now about how subsidy reform can be undertaken. We know that there are three elements to it, that firstly, there's a need often to change the mechanism by which governments price um, energy or, or deal with policies within the energy sector. They need to move away from, on the consumer side from regulating prices to, to moving towards automatic pricing mechanisms that fit in with uh, changes in global prices in the world market. Um, that the second part then is there's an, always a need for support within governments for reform, uh, both within governments and within the population more generally. And I think it's the third aspect that we're particularly focusing on today, that successful reform needs mitigation of adverse impacts, because of course subsidies do bring benefits to certain parts of the population, certain parts of the economy. Some of those are poor, some of those are vulnerable, and they deserve the attention of policymakers in order to um, in, in, in such that those uh, impacts can be mitigated, can be dealt with. And it's possibly one of the aspects of subsidy reform that's understudied and under and not well enough understood. And the purpose of today's webinar is therefore to, to say, you know, how can we think about mitigating impacts of subsidy reform, given that, that in general they are a, um, you know, they, they can be a good thing towards moving us toward clean energy transitions and all the benefits there. But there's a lot of aspects that need to be taken into account. And really pleased today with the panel that we have and that we'll be able to look into some of the key aspects of, uh, of the mitigation challenge um, about health, about communities, about gender and about civil society. And all of these need to be taken into account if we're going to have um, fossil fuel subsidy reform that's just and that fits into and supports clean energy transitions. So that's our, our focus for today, to look at practical options of how, when considering subsidy reform, governments can make those just. And we've got a great panel ahead of us, um, which we'll come to a little bit later, and I'll introduce them uh, when it's their turn to speak. We've got plenty of time for a Q&A. Um, please raise your questions either in the Q&A function on Zoom, um, if you're on the Zoom, platform, or otherwise we have other, uh, other methods. Some people are looking at this webinar through the, the live Twitter. Um, and if you use the, the handle at global subsidies, you can raise questions and comments on that. And there's also a hashtag, um, hashtag FFSR talk, FFSR talk. And please uh, raise your questions there and we'll come to those later in the piece. Um, but before going any further, I would also, I'm really, really pleased today that we've got a representation from the IEA at very high level. Um, we've got Dr. Brian Motherway with us. He's the head of the Energy Efficiency Division at the IEA. He's overseeing a whole range of analytical and outreach programs supporting energy efficiency globally, uh, but also has a wider role in the IEA. And prior to joining the IEA, uh, Brian was Chief Executive of the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland, so uh, uniquely well-placed to speak to us today. Um, Brian, we 
very much appreciate some welcoming remarks from you and also a little bit about a little bit more about the the global commission as well thank you thank you peter and hello to everybody joining us today it's a great pleasure to be here and peter thank you for for bringing this together and for hosting us today and i want to recognize iasd's leadership in this topic as in many others and as you say peter this is a really important discussion and it's really timely for several reasons and, and first of all it's timely because in the last year, we've seen so many countries step up their ambition on decarbonization of their energy systems and, and setting net zero targets for 2050 or other key dates. And we see a lot of ambition. Uh, and of course, uh, it's great to see that ambition, but we also need to see the action. And, and of course, we in the IEA are working with governments all over the world to translate ambition into real tangible action. And one part of that is we recently published our net zero 2050 roadmap for the energy system. It's one way of thinking about what a net zero energy system could look like in 2050 and more crucially, how we get there. And how we get there is to act very strongly and very quickly. And that's the real lesson of our analysis is that uh, governments need to move much faster than they're doing now, to be frank, and need to uh, uh, step up to a number of policy domains uh, to instigate stronger action. And, and the analysis also shows that, that fossil fuel subsidy reform is really key because energy and carbon pricing is an essential uh, dimension of considering how we get to net zero in our energy systems as quickly as possible. Uh, and fossil fuel subsidy reform, we know, of course, that there are sensitivities. As you said, Peter, we know some of the laudable goals behind fossil fuel subsidies. We know some of their social aims and the importance of that, but we also know that they don't always work that well, be it in terms of the uh, of who benefits, uh, who is bearing the cost of, of these types of policies, and also how they fit with a, with a decarbonization pathway for, for energy systems uh, globally. Um, but as you say, it's easy to say that, Peter, we need to know how to do this well, how to learn from experience, and that's what today is all about. Um, IEA has been working with IASD and many others in this space for many years, and we do track uh, progress on, and trends on fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, and of course, we know that in 2020, uh, falling fossil fuel demand and falling prices uh, pulled down the value of fossil fuel uh, consumption subsidies to a record low. But on the other hand, that's not necessarily good news. It happened for the wrong reasons. And we fully expect in 21 and beyond, but even literally here in 21, we will see a rebound. We see fuel prices coming back. We see demand coming back. We see massive increases in energy demand and, and related emissions in 2021. And of course, we see what I can best describe it as hesitant progress on pricing reforms You know, in the current climate for understandable reasons. Um, so we're at a really timely moment to think about fossil fuel subsidy reform and how to move forward and how to learn from each other, which what today is all about. Um, we report, as you know, along with the OECD to the G20 every year on progress on fossil fuel subsidy reform. And our most recent report just came out a few weeks ago. And, and there are some really good examples uh, of progress. And we'll hear later today uh, from a really excellent example in Indonesia that, that has really done some really interesting things on fossil fuel subsidy reform. We've also highlighted recently interesting work going on in Mexico, uh, Oman, and many other countries. But the reason why I mentioned Indonesia, Mexico, and Oman is all three of those countries' energy ministers sit on the Global Commission for People-Centered Clean Energy Transitions, which is the context we're talking in today. Um, this commission was convened about seven or eight months ago by our executive director, Dr. Fatih Baral, in recognition that clean energy transitions, first of all, are for people and about people, and they need to be people at the center. They need to be about making people's lives better uh, and, and, and helping people with wider social and economic questions uh, in the context of the clean energy opportunity and the clean energy imperative. But also in recognition that clean energy transitions will quite simply fail if they're not people-centered. I certainly believe that very strongly, and I think all members of the commission do as well, that, that unless we get better at understanding how to, how to include inclusiveness, fairness, justice, 
and and engagement in our in our clean energy transition policies they will simply fail because people won't accept them people will vote parties out of office people will take to the streets as we've seen in many countries uh, and we need to give this issue greater attention so the global commission comprises 30 people from around the world uh, two thirds of them are energy climate ministers from every kind of country large small rich poor energy importer energy producer bringing their wisdom and perspectives on how clean energy transition sit in their own social policy objectives their own economic development objectives and bringing their experience positive and negative to bear in terms of what works and what doesn't work the commission also has representatives from civil society from labor unions from youth uh, and other important perspectives again working as a group of individuals to figure out what has worked and what hasn't so the commission when we first met them uh, earlier this year, said to us as their secretary very strongly two things. First of all, they really believe these issues need attention and they want to make actionable recommendations that can really make a practical impact very quickly. So the commission will make these recommendations in just a few weeks time in October. Uh, and the reason for that timing is of course that COP takes place in early November. And the commission is determined that the recommendations uh, it makes and the wisdom it pulls uh, will have a real impact on COP and subsequent discussions about how to accelerate our transitions. And that was the second point that the Commission members stressed to us, is they want these uh, measures to have an impact. So they want people to hear about them, to engage with us, uh, to tell us their experience. And that's very much part of what we're hoping to do today. Um, when you see the recommendations, which you'll see shortly, and we'll certainly welcome everybody's feedback and ongoing discussion of this, you'll see there's kind of four core themes emerging in discussion on, on what makes a clean energy transition people-centered. First of all, clean energy transitions really need to ensure that they create good, decent, proper jobs for people in all parts of the world, in all sectors, for all types of skills uh, and preferences. And they also need to protect communities, regions, and individuals that may be negatively affected by job losses. And we know, unfortunately, that will happen. We know that clean energy transitions will create many, many more jobs than are destroyed in the process, but they won't always be in the same places, in the same sectors, and for the same people and communities. We need to recognize the importance of concentrating on that issue. Secondly, Clean energy transitions need to be fully aligned with social and economic development. They, they, they can't be in opposition to each other. And, and uh, countries, for example, that still don't have universal energy access uh, need to recognize that, that energy access and affordability, elimination of, of fuel poverty, they're all integral parts of the definition of clean energy transitions and need to remain absolute priorities in, in the policy choices being made. Thirdly, Policies that involve change, whether it's changing the price of energy, whether it's changing how we heat our homes, how we how we drive around, how we live our lives, they all involve change. And that sometimes involves perturbation. It can sometimes be seen as, as having negative impacts on people. And we need to make sure that those policies don't disproportionately impact on vulnerable groups, such as poorer communities, excluded groups. We need to prioritize questions like, like gender equity and social inclusion. And all of the changes coming in clean energy in the, in the coming decades Decades, starting here and now in 2021 creates a huge opportunity to really make sure that these kind of issues are, are addressed properly and in a fully integrated way. Fourthly, as I mentioned earlier, people, clean energy transitions are about people. People are active participants in clean energy transitions, whether it's, it's, it's accepting at a national level or an international level, the changes that are coming, whether it's accepting local infrastructure or build out of renewables, or whether it's changing their own behavior in terms of the, the appliances they buy, how they use those appliances, uh, how they perceive what they're paying for energy, all of these questions involve people in very many ways. And we really need to ensure that we're communicating very well with, with, with the public in general, that we're involving them in decision-making and that we're making sure that they have a, an opportunity both to influence and be part of these clean energy transitions that are so important to all of us. So we're very keen um, that the, the process uh, that the Global Commission is in the midst of is inclusive and open. So we're very uh, keen to hear on this topic today from all of the participants and all of the people listening to us. We're very happy if anyone wants to follow up with us directly. Uh, we've, we've run a number of workshops on different themes to make sure that we're hearing from many voices and many diverse perspectives on these topics. Uh, and I do really hope we can continue to engage with you all when the recommendations come out in just a few weeks time. What is discussed today will influence those recommendations. They're still in discussion, they're still in draft, 
draft form very much so. So we'll be listening very closely to the discussions today uh, and we'll be bringing the discussions to the members of the Commission uh, immediately after today so it can influence their thinking as they develop and finalise their recommendations. So Peter, thank you very much for involving us. I'm really looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Super, thanks so much, Brian. Um, and I should recognize, of course, which I didn't before, the IEA's great leadership in this area. You, you mentioned some of your work there on net zero, but also supporting this commission, the long series of data, which we'll have a little bit of a look at later on fossil fuel subsidies uh, and all the other aspects. And I think um, it's been terrific to see what's coming out of the IEA the last few years. So thank you for that. And also for um, you know, making, I think, the main points of, of our discussion today, we must act very strongly and very quickly but for it to be successful, it has to be inclusive with justice and we, it needs a lot of engagement as well. So you know, that, that's the situation where we're at. Um, and thanks, Brian, for being able to stay on the call with us all day today. And we look forward to your closing remarks um, afterwards as well. Okay, so moving on now to, um, uh, we will give from ISD's perspective, a, a, just a little bit more context on where we're coming from today. And um, be honest, if you could load up the presentation we have. Okay, thanks so much, Jonas. So we wanted to, to give a little bit more context of where uh, fossil fuel subsidy reform is fitting within the clean energy transition and also uh, about the data that's available for you know, the, the public debates that need to be encouraged as we look at subsidy reform. Uh, because without sort of good information and good understanding, it's very hard to have an informed public discussion about the, the pros and the cons of moving into reform. So we'll firstly have a little bit of a discussion about um, what might a fossil fuel free recovery look like? And that's clearly the, the context we find ourselves into today. Countries around the world are still um, battling very strongly with the COVID pandemic, but are thinking about recovery, have put significant amounts of money into that recovery. And this is an opportunity for clean energy transition and for subsidy reform. Uh, next slide, please, Jonas. And if you want to see more about um, some of ISD and our global subsidies initiative work on fossil fuel recovery, there's a link here, Achieving Fossil Fuel Recovery. Everything's on our website. Next, please. Okay, and we've come up with five principles here that we think are important for uh, thinking about the recovery and making it as clean as possible. And this is the context within which we then need to look at the people-centered uh, elements and aspects as well. First one, if we look at the money that's gone into um, recovery so far that's related to the energy sector, either to energy producing or consuming activities, um, energypolicytracker.org is an initiative run by ISD and other NGOs, other institutes uh, to track uh, so far in 31 major economies and eight multilateral development banks, where has the money gone in the energy sector so far? And you'll see from this graph that a larger proportion has gone into fossil fuels than has into clean. There's another category as well where it's, it's not quite clear or there are some things that, are, that don't fit well into either. But the main point here is to see that out of the 336 billion pledged, more of that money so far has gone into fossil fuels than in clean. And that doesn't really support the idea that we're moving towards clean energy transitions. And so principle one on a fossil fuel recovery is do not provide public money to fossil fuel production. And um, we already have enough as a world uh, of recognized um, reserves of oil, gas, and coal to go past the 1.5 degree and even two degree uh, budgets that we have under the Paris Agreement. So principle one, um, there's no, we don't think there's any longer any need for public money to go to fossil fuel production. Next please, Jonas. Secondly, there's a really good opportunity from fossil fuel subsidy reform and also from taxation to help to pay for the recovery, to help to pay for clean energy transition and other development um, priorities. If we look at the, if, if, there is, if there were a reform of subsidies to gasoline and diesel and to coal for power generation, um, alongside a a tax that was added to gasoline and diesel, a trans transport sector 
um, you know, transport fuels of 12 and a half cents US per litre. So, you know, a, an appreciable amount, but not large um, compared to taxes in many countries. And also a $5 per tonne um, of coal. Coal is very lowly taxed, very, has very low rates of tax in, um, in most of the world. From those activities, you could raise over half a billion US dollars per year globally. So over 500, here are our figure, 553 billion US dollars per year. That, of course, is a significant amount of money that could be used for post-pandemic recovery and that transition to net zero. Uh, next, please. Next up, what about swapping some of that 553 billion into the clean energy transition? And there's a few comparisons on, on the screen in front of you here. That 553 billion, which would be available every year, so it's not a one-off, um, you make that saving, and that's a saving to government budgets year after year or an increase in the revenue. That's 90% of the investment needed for solar photovoltaic and wind energy um, across the world as, as their part of moving to, to 1.5 degrees. Four times as much as the investment needed for EVs, electric vehicle charging infrastructure, it's over half of the investment needed for energy efficiency in buildings, and it's a lot more, 12 times more, the investment needed for attaining universal energy access. So there's a very interesting policy option here for governments around the world, swapping their support that they're giving to fossil fuels and moving some of that into clean energy uh, in order to, to help with the transition and the goals that come with that. Next, please. Number four, incentivize clean energy investment. The, the graph on the left is showing um, you know, this very uh, encouraging trend that it's wind and utility sales, scale, utility scale solar, which now have the, the lowest cost uh, generation of electricity compared to nuclear, compared to coal, and compared to gas combined cycle. So a super opportunity here, and governments can can therefore uh, play a very important role to incentivize clean and electricity investment. How might they do that? Firstly, get the subsidies right, you know, move them away from fossil fuels, ideally as well, a little bit towards, um, uh, fossil, to, towards renewables. There's the possibility to mandate um, public finance institutions, including the, uh, the, the MDBs, the IFIs, the, the PFIs, um, to help with things such as country specific risks where they can play a very important role to unblock clean energy investment. And then one of the aspects I think that's gonna come up in, in a lot of countries going forward is state owned enterprises play a very important role in electricity sectors. How might they be part of the transition away from fossil fuels and to clean energy and supporting subsidy reform of course as part of that. Um, you know, they're gonna be there, they're gonna be there for the long term. What role can they play? Next, please, Jonas. And the fifth principle is today's topic of conversation. How can this transition be a just one? Within those reports, we look at, uh, within, within our report, Fossil Fuel Recovery, about workers, it's about employers, it's about government, and, and a whole load of engagement. I won't go into that because we've got much, uh, much more detail on that coming up. Next, please, Jonas. And then the second element I wanted to talk to you today, just a little bit about the, the information that's available on fossil fuel subsidies around the world. Um, there's a, a joint um, initiative undertaken by the OECD and by us at ISD uh, to collate all the international estimates that have been made um, on fossil fuels subsidies into one source. You can find that at fossilfuelsubsidytracker.org. It includes the information that the IEA has collected for many years on consumer subsidies. There's further information on some extra countries from the IMF. And then there's a whole uh, inventory support database uh, put together by the OECD. And this database, uh, for this website, fossilfuelsubsidytracker.org, allows, um, brings all those information sources together and allows um, some investigation of those data. I'll give you a few examples of what you can see from that. Next, please, Jonas. So here is a graph showing um, how fossil fuel subsidies have changed over time. And, and as Brian mentioned, uh, they've been going down in the last few years, which is, um, you know, if it's for the right reasons, it's, it's encouraging. And I think we see you know, subsidies are still very heavily influenced by global oil prices. As global oil price goes up, the level of subsidy goes up. And as it goes down, they go down. But there has overlaid on that as well. There is progress towards, uh, there has been progress towards reform in many countries as well. 
Again, as Brian mentioned, it's not fast enough, but there are, uh, there are some good examples from around the world. So you can see here the, the estimates broken down by fuel type, by coal, electricity, natural gas, petroleum products. And you can get that information for any of the um, countries around the world that are included in that database. Next, please. Where are they going to in terms of mechanism? A um, little bit of jargon here, over 50% is going to induce to transfers. That essentially means where governments are regulating prices of fuels to consumers. So they're not allowing them to, um, to alter with respect to global markets or global prices. They're sort of saying, you know, this is the price they should be for gasoline or for diesel or whatever it might be. And that remains the largest source of subsidies um, from the database, so, so from global estimates on consumers and producers. And then also important, there's direct budgetary transfers, nearly 20% of the total, and tax expenditure, which is a category where governments will give tax holidays or tax reductions or other, other types of uh, revenue foregone measures where they could be collecting more taxation or other income from um, the fossil fuel sector, but they aren't. And that, and that is, in effect, a subsidy to that sector. Next, please. And then the last one here, just to show by fuel, it's, it's petroleum products that are over half of that total, which was 468 billion in 2019. And then very interestingly, electricity is an important category. Uh, electricity generation, um, this includes the part that is, is from fossil fuels, of course, uh, only. And it's a, a really important question for countries around the world now. And you know, what are they, how do they, best price electricity, given that it's really important for development, it's really important for people towards, uh, towards the bottom of the income scale, um, but it's very expensive as well to a lot of governments around the world now, so what to do with that? And natural gas uh, will be a key question as well going forward. You know, what are countries going to do with natural gas? Um, is, it, you know, is it really some sort of uh, bridge to a renewable future, or is it time to move directly to renewables? Next, please. Okay, thank you. So that's enough from me. I hope that gives a little bit of context about where subsidies are fitting in sort of more general clean energy transition goals around the world. And now I'm really pleased uh, to move to the panel part of today's discussion. We've got four um, superb speakers with us today, and I'll introduce them as it's their turn uh, to make their initial remarks. Please, as I said, put your questions to them in the q and You can see them coming through in Zoom, um, in Twitter, uh, at Global Subsidies or hashtag FFSR, dot, um, FFSR talk or one thing. Our first speaker then today, I'm delighted to be able to introduce from the World Health Organization, Heather Adair Rohani. She leads the work on energy and health at the World Health Organization, the HQ here in Geneva. Um, and you know, for those of you who are being aware, this has been an increasing priority for the WHO in the last few years. Heather has led the establishment of the Health and Energy Platform of Action and also the High-Level high Coalition on Health and Energy. And again, I'd encourage all of you to look at that work and get engaged as, as you can. And importantly as well, she's co-led coordination and development of guidelines from the WHO on indoor air quality, which is a huge issue when we talk about subsidies, uh, and also is overseeing the work to support countries through the Clean Household Energy Solutions uh, toolkit. Um, I could go on and say a lot more about Heather, um, uh, but she's uh, extremely well involved in, in the energy and health debates on all sorts of aspects. So Heather, we'd be really interested to hear from you today um, with your remarks and, and your thoughts, uh, particularly about you know, how we might deal with the health issue within, within this whole fossil fuel subsidy reform uh, problem. So I'm very happy to pass over the, the virtual floor to you. Thank you so much, Peter, and thank you so much. Hello to everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. First, I'd like to wish you guys a happy Clean Air Day for Blue Skies. Today is the second annual Clean Air Day for Blue Skies. The first one was kicked off last year, so a very busy day for health and air pollution. Um, so as, as described, I am, my name is Heather Adair Rohani, and I lead the work on health and energy at WHO. And as you can imagine, I will be speaking about fossil fuel subsidy reform and health. <laughs> But before beginning, I, I just really want to give my appreciation to the organizers 
for preparing this session and taking on a challenging topic at such a critical time with the high level dialogue and energy happening in September, the COP coming up in November, the potential to protect health through improving the, uh, through clean energy transition couldn't be greater. And we uh, really glad to have, opportunity to have, have the opportunity to speak to this at this moment. So let's begin. So I'm gonna start off, I'm gonna do my best to provide a balanced presentation, how fossil fuels impact health and how such fossil fuel subsidy reform um, holds substantial benefits for the health of the population and planet. It's implemented in a way that puts people at the center and is tailored specifically to a country's needs. So let's think about, so how is it that fossil fuel use impacts health? The most obvious is air pollution. The inefficient fuel use of fossil fuels is an important source of air pollution, probably the largest source of air pollution. Um, the products of incomplete combustion resulting from inefficient um, fossil fuel use uh, produces pollutants, health energy pollutants like particulate matter, but nitrogen oxides and others. They're important sources of ill health. Breathing in such pollutants impacts not only the lungs, but systemically impacts the different organs in our bodies and really impacts the body throughout. Chronic exposure to air pollution um, puts people at increased risk for diseases like ischemic heart disease, stroke, cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, asthma. And even recent epidemiological evidence is also linking exposure to such air pollution with cognitive issues and disabilities and, and diabetes, even adverse pregnancy outcomes. So these women, who are, who are looking forward to bringing a new birth, a baby into this world are, are forcing being forced to breathe in air pollution are actually causing problems for their, 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 their unborn babies. So there is massive potential for protecting the health of public health from uh, protecting public health um, from air pollution. Now, and, and it's really important, there's specific actually even linkages to specific fossil fuels. For example, as mentioned, we have guidelines on indoor air quality for household fuel combustion. And where we specifically have as WHO a, a recommendation discouraging the use of kerosene, a, a fossil fuel, because of the adverse impacts. They, one study, for example, found that people you, you know, lighting their homes with kerosene caused an increased risk of nine times for tuberculosis. Um, in addition, the coal, coal is a specific pollutant, um, a carcinogen declared by the um, IARC, our International Agency for, for, for um, Carcinogens, Research in Carcinogens. So this is a very critical, has massive impacts uh, on health. And it's important to note that many of these diseases will, yes, ultimately lead to premature death. But looking at only deaths fails to account for the substantial daily burden that each of these diseases has on the individual. Many of these people poor are already burdened with many things. Imagine spending each day, months, years with labored breaths, struggling to do simple tasks hours, days, weeks missing work due to a daily struggle of disease caused to you just by breathing the air around you. So let's put some numbers to the effects to help us better understand what this really means. I say it's bad for health, so how bad for health is it? WH estimates that around 4.2 million deaths each year are attributed, attributed to ambient air pollution, much of which is caused by fossil fuel use. Other recent studies looking to quantify the roles of fossil fuels also suggest millions of premature deaths are caused by fossil fuels. For example, one recent study estimates that around two thirds of air pollution deaths worldwide can be attributed to fossil fuel use. Another study suggests where that natural gas and coal combustion are responsible for around one in five premature deaths, ultimately estimating around eight million deaths. But in summary, although the figures are very different, they're all number, all big. These numbers are all big, really big, and all can, uh, most of which can be avoided and protect the health of people. And as mentioned, um, these also, you know, these mentioned the specific health impacts, but there's other health impacts that are not accounted for, such as um, those resulting from climate change or the long term impacts of climate change or the social impacts, for example, land degradation or people having to move. So the, these are all from fossil fuel use, so which we, we can really take, a, 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 take issue with and use policy mechanisms to, to, to protect the health and, and changing the way that we use energy is critical to doing that. So indeed, the potential to protect millions of lives from cutting our dependence on fossil fuels paired with improvements in energy and efficiency and uptake of renewables is massive, huge, and can serve as an important policy driver to reform fossil fuel subsidies. So indeed, we need to be quantifying, we really need to be considering and, and looking more closely at how fossil fuels are, in, are impacting health adversely. 
However, we also need to make sure that such reforms and actions are planned and implemented in a way that leaves no one behind. So like many things in life, it's not so black and white, particularly when it comes to health. Fossil fuel subsidy reform is a bit of a complex topic, which requires thorough analysis and evaluation. And should we really tailor to the specific needs of the country and its population? Now, so you may be thinking, I just told you these horrible health impacts from fossil fuel use. How come I'm not just outright saying we should ban all fossil fuels? Why bother reforming? Why don't we just ban them and stop their use altogether? And that's because fossil fuel subsidies also provide a lot of health protection for, for many underserved communities, poor households, and serve as a lifeline for many poor populations around the world. Around one third of the world's population relies on polluting stoves and fuels for cooking, leading to some 3.8 million deaths annually from household air pollution. Again, talking in millions. So simple, efficient, ineffic simple inefficient stoves paired with solid fuels and kerosene release very, very high levels of pollutants in and around the home. And in some cases, there are 100 times more than what WHO for air quality guidelines value say are safe for health. And this puts household members at even greater risk from the health effects of air pollution um, as, the, as the concentrations are so, so high compared to that of air, ambient air pollution. So furthermore, in more pla many places, much of the ambient air pollution, um, in some cases accounting up to half the ambient air pollution is actually caused by the household air pollution leaking outdoors. So why am I talking about air household air pollution? Because in many places, the household air pollution is often caught, is often can be um, averted with the use of fossil fuels as a transitional clean cooking students, um, and, as a clean cooking solution. So based on extensive reviews of the scientific evidence and epidemiological studies, WHO, WHO has actually found, has defined what is considered clean fuels and technology in the home for health. And in fact, some of those include some fossil fuels. But these fossil fuels we consider as a transitional scalable clean cooking solution so we can get to the ultimate clean that we want for health and that's electricity from renewable sources. And that's not yes, not electricity from coal fired power plants. We're not advocating that, but you know, we really ultimately want to get to electricity, but in that pathway, we need to consider fossil fuels may serve as a transitional way. So for many of these households, particularly those in more urban and peri-urban areas, fossil fuels like LPG or natural gas actually serve as an important scalable transitional clean cooking solution that can provide immediate health benefits can actually ultimately also protect our climate. Uh, as IEA has done an important analysis where we can actually see that, for example, it will be uh, um, the climate impacts of actually using LPG in households without well, lacking access to clean cooking is actually better than if we were to, 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 to not implement. So they actually have carbon, uh, uh, climate benefits from, from using fossil fuels in these cases. Um, so it's, it's critical to ensure that it's so it's very critical that we these households can still afford uh, fossil fuels as their substitute as they're transitioning to clean, clean, um, cleaner, ultimately cleaner solutions than electricity. So um, in this case, the this is where the blanket statement where banning fossil fuel subsidies is not necessarily inclusive and could put the health of the poorest populations at greatest risk. And this is where countries, they've got to design and implement a clean energy solution transition that's tailored to their needs, the available resources of their population. And in some cases, indeed, this might necessitate a limited to the time balance set of fossil fuel use for the poor end users while clean solutions become more available. Um, but in this case, I would consider it not necessarily a subsidy as it's really more social good or investment to protecting public health. So, and it's a bit of a so in some in some summary there are two sides of the coin when it comes to fossil fuel subsidy reform and for health. In, in one case, it is really critical to thoroughly evaluate the best solutions for countries in their particular context. For in some parts of the world, eliminating fossil fuels entirely um, will clean up the air, protect public health. Let's get um, people on electric cars. Let's really be cleaning up the communities. We will protect the climate and provide economic savings that can be invested in public health and other social services protect our lands, protect biodiversity and our climate. And in other cases, however, a more focused and tailored and often slower paced phase out of fossil fuel subsidy will be required to ensure an inclusive people-centered transition, uh, people-centered clean energy transition. 
So to support decision makers, for example, WHO is working really hard to compile the evidence to provide the tools and, and capacity for countries to actually look at their specific situation, the health of their population, what available resources there are, to really plan a longer term so, uh, clean energy transition that really puts people at the center uh, of and, and make sure that no one's left behind um, in, in the clean energy transition. So again, it's it's not a cut and dry, easy uh, topic, but I think it's it's important that countries really are able to look at it in in, um, in, a, in a very tailored way, as there's both benefit, there's positive benefits for health from fossil fuel subsidy reform for both poor and higher income countries, as long as it's done in a tailored and and, and people centered way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather, for, for sharing your expertise there and, and for talking about the nuances here. You know, not all subsidies are the same, not all fossil fuels are the same as well. I just want to ask uh, one quick follow up question, if I may, which was you know, when we when we saw the discussion in Ontario, in Canada, about the, the phase out of coal for power generation, um, the, the health community got very engaged in that conversation and said, you know, we would like to see this change made because it's, you know, as you were saying, it's about air pollution and air pollution has so many adverse effects on so many people. Um, are you seeing sort of health professionals and health communities getting involved in energy sector discussions and, and you know, energy finance discussions almost, you know, and you know, are, are there examples or is this something that needs to be encouraged and, and you've got any advice on that? Oh, well, that, that's a very good question and something that we're really pushing hard at WHO because we, we feel that the, the clean energy transition is not something that can be done by one sector, it can't be led by the energy sector. We all have a part to play and indeed we're really trying to encourage the health sector to play a more prominent role in advocating for how looking at fossil fuels, looking at this clean energy transition can really protect health and to serve as agents of change. You know, nobody's going to argue with, nobody's going to argue with health you know you can't say no i'm sorry you, you, i don't i don't want to protect people's lives i don't want to protect their health so this is where we can actually leverage the health argument to really push policy and drive and can use this as a common ground to say yeah let's look at how this policy impacts health we all want to protect health how can we make sure and maximize the health benefits accordingly indeed we are trying and i think it's important that um we have the health community advocating more more profoundly in, 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 we're interacting more with environment, energy, development, gender, all of these people need to be working together to really tackle this at, in a way that's comprehensive, thorough, and really gets out what we're trying to do. And that's protect the people, the planet, and, and our climate. Um, and, and that's something we all need to do. And the more we can encourage we, the health community to, to shout out we can. WHO is providing health sector training, for example. We provide tools. Um, where you could where policymakers can look at, for example, um, what are different policies and programs for health with energy use, where you can look at the health savings, the savings to the healthcare system, savings to the individual, as well as the climate. So they can actually look at the different um, choices that are made. This will help provide really health-based arguments for, for planning the clean energy transition. Super, and good to hear there that that there are all, all those tools and analyses and techniques at the WHO, so this seems a good place to start for any country or process who wants to get a bit more involved with, with health community stakeholders. You know, start with you, start with WHO, we can work from there. I'm sure there'll be a lot more questions for you um, later, Heather, but thank you very much for, for taking us through uh, all the nuances and the, the impacts and, and some of the questions we've got to consider. Uh, and I want to turn to, my, to our second panelist today. Uh, really delighted to have with us today, uh, Parudi uh, Gubel. Um, he's the Head of Communication and Communications and Partnerships of the Secretariat of uh, something which I'm sure a lot of you heard of, TNP2K. It's the National Team for the Acceleration of Poverty Reduction um, in Indonesia. It's part of the Office of the Vice President of the Republic um, of Indonesia. Um, Rudy's been uh, involved in clean energy discussions, in poverty discussions, in um, subsidy discussions for many years. And, and as Brian mentioned at the, the, the top of the event, uh, Indonesia has made significant progress on subsidy reform over the years. Um, from Rudy, Rudy in particular, he's, his role is he includes advocating for new and improved policies in poverty reduction, and also the switch from fossil fuels to clean energy at the community level in Indonesia. 
Um, and we're going back here to some of the issues that Heather was talking about, in particular reforming LPG, so liquid petroleum gas, uh, bottle gas, and electricity subsidies. Uh, Parudi has also held a whole range of previous senior manager, managerial positions in private and state-owned companies, including expert staff to Minister of Energy and Mineral Resources, a very important minister there in, um, in Indonesia, and senior advisor at the Indonesia Oil, Plant, Oil Palm Plantation Fund Management Agency. So really, we're, we're absolutely delighted to have you with us today, and we wanted to hear from you more um, a little bit more about communities and their involvement in, in these discussions about fossil fuel subsidy reform. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be part of this uh, forum. Uh, I'm happy to be here and as usual, because IISD has been uh, a generous partner uh, to us in discussing about uh, everything related to energy transitions, uh, fossil fuel uh, uh, reform, fossil fuel subsidy reform, and many other things. So uh, this is really a very good opportunity to exchange ideas uh, and to have uh, a fruitful discussions. Let me share my uh, screen. Hmm. OK, uh, my. Uh, the topic of my presentation today is ensuring equitable access to energy subsidy in fossil fuel subsidy reform to support energy transition. I would like to be uh, speaking uh, in the case of LPG subsidy reform in Indonesia, which is something that is now going on, uh, something that we have been working uh, for quite a while. And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, it is now, uh, you know, in the process of uh, execution. Uh, I would like to start with you uh, with the, uh, uh, just to give you the idea about the magnitude of LPG subsidy in Indonesia. Yeah, as you may know that energy subsidy are the largest government subsidy or assistance in Indonesian government, yeah. Uh, it is much bigger than subsidies or assistance for food, education, health, the economy, everything, you name it. Yeah, as you may see that in 2019, the Indonesian government allocated uh, total uh, assistance and subsidies to uh, Indonesian people. It's around 390 trillion Indonesian rupiah. And out of 390 trillion, the subsidy that uh, went to energy subsidy include fuel, electricity, and LPG. The total is 163.18 trillion Indonesian rupiah. So as you can see that it, it, it is almost half of the uh, budget, government budget for as, uh, government assistance and subsidies basically went to the energy subsidy. And if we break down the energy subsidy, uh, between fuel, electricity, and LPG, in 2020, the government allocated 49.5 trillion, or almost 50 trillion Indonesian rupiah for LPG subsidy. Just to give you some uh, uh, context that the subsidy is basically uh, received or uh, give an effect to 50 million household. Or if we uh, calculate in individuals, it is more than 200 million individuals. Yeah, so it is, uh, the magnitude is very big in terms of budget and in terms of uh, those who receive uh, or involved in the uh, subsidy. So with this context, we can see that uh, most of the subsidy that uh, went to energy subsidy, including LPG subsidy, it reduced the government's ability to finance other productive programs such as education, health, poverty reduction, infrastructure development, and also for the development of renewable energy. Uh, I want to say to you that I think this is a case that happens in many countries. But in Indonesia, if we see that the existing LPG subsidy policy is basically an ironic policy. Yeah, There are huge budget allocation, mostly imported, but we can see that more than 12 million poor and vulnerable household 
still using firewood as a source of cooking energy. So if you see in one hand, on the left side of my screen, uh, of my slides, uh, every year, Indonesia consume around 7.75 million metric ton LPG consumption, which is 72% of it are imported, 92% of it subsidized, and allocating almost 50 trillion Indonesian rupiah for uh, the subsidy budget. On the other hand, look at the right side of my slides, we still have 12.41 million households still using firewood for cooking. So if you talk about 12.41 12, 12, uh, million, it means around 56 million individuals. So you can imagine that a country that consumes 7.75 million metric ton of LPG consumption, spending 50 trillion, almost 50 trillion Indonesian rupiah, but there are more than 50 million individuals still using firewood for cooking. And if we break down again, if you want to talk about uh, you know uh, social inclusion, gender and uh, uh, gender related, yeah, there are 2.7 million house household headed by female that have no access to LPG, and 4.1 million household that have family members with disabilities also not have access to LPG. So that's why I say this is a very ironic policy. We spend a lot of money. Yeah, we imported a lot of, a, a lot of uh, LPG, but hence uh, lots of Indonesians still uh, excluded. The next slide is just to give you an idea about how the LPG consumptions uh, rose. In 2010, you see yeah, that the subsidized uh, LPG is around 2.71 uh, million metric ton. The non-subsidized is only around uh, 0 0.85 uh, million metric ton. And in 2020, it rose up to 7.13 million metric ton of subsidized. And then the non-subsidized is relatively the same. It's around 6 point, uh, 0 0.62 million metric ton. And if you can see on the, uh, on the right side of the uh, slide, the LPG sources, yeah, uh, the imported uh, sources increase from only 58.9% up to 72.1% in 2020. So what I'm trying to say here is that uh, it is an ironic policy, and it is also encouraged imported fossil fuel dependency. And this has happened since the kerosene to LPG conversion policy in 2007. Yeah. Since that, LPG consumption has con continued to increase with most of the source of LPG procurement from imports. Uh, in 2007, as you may know, yeah, that Indonesia started the conversion from kerosene, which the main idea is that to reduce the subsidy and to reduce the use of fossil fuel. But if you if you see in the previous slide, yeah, there is a significant increasing in LPG consumption. So it's like you put uh, one thing, you take out one thing in one pocket, but you put that in another pocket, but still uh, there. Yeah, you see that the other uh, problem that uh, we face, yeah, with the existing policy, existing LPG policy, is that the practice of a criminal act due to price disparity all income all income groups prefer to consume subsidized uh, product price differences also encourage criminal acts of hoarding and adulteration for subsidized lpg if you see that in indonesia there are three uh, products of lpg there is 12 kilogram which is non subsidized there is 5.5 kilogram which is also non subsidized and there is three kilogram which is subsidized. As you see in the graph, uh, in the graphic on the left side, yeah, most of income income group they prefer to uh, purchase the subsidized. Yeah, of course because it is way cheaper than uh, the non-subsidized. And the price disparity, as you may see on the right side uh, of the uh, slides, yeah, is way different. The non-subsidized price is around 11,260 uh, rupiah per kilogram, 
and the subsidized price is 4250 uh, rupiah per kilogram so this price price disparity you know uh, give incentive for for criminal act yeah hoarding uh, adulterations uh, for the subsidized lpg uh, this is from the budget perspective yeah i mentioned to you earlier that in 2007 indonesia started the kerosene to lpg conversion you see on the right side the graph on the right side of my slides yeah at the time the government claimed that the, pro, the, the the policy was very successful it was the policy was very successful the kerosene to lpg conversion because at that time the government managed to reduce 9.9 uh, .9 million kerosene consumption yeah we uh, have 40 trillion budget savings yeah but in addition to that the government also spent 20 trillion for conversion infrastructure because at that time the government gave the uh, starter kit which consists of the stove and the cylinder of the lpg yeah so basically the total saving that the government has at that time is around only uh, 20 trillion but on the left side you can see that uh, the lpg subsidy budget allocation soar up from only 25.87 trillion to almost around 50 trillion in 2020 so if you can see that the problem that we face with the existing policy of lpg subsidy is basically uh you know uh side of the uh impact of the 2007 kerosene to lpg conversion uh this is the, just to give you the idea that how inequal the LPG subsidy in Indonesia now. Uh, this is the distribution of income group from the poorest to the richest. As you may see, in Indonesia, we consider poor and vulnerable is those who are below 40% income group. So from uh, decile one, two, three, and four. So the 40% uh, below income group only receive 32% of the total subsidy. So it means that more than uh, almost 70%, yeah, or 68% of the subsidy is basically uh, received or enjoyed by 50% richest uh, group. Yeah. This is uh, based on the uh, average, uh, average subsidy received based on income group. You see that the lowest 40% only receive 40,800 per month and the richest 50% uh, receive 43,323 uh, Indonesian rupiah per month. So those 50% richest, they are not only uh, ineligible to receive the subsidy, but the fact that they receive more subsidy compared to the 40% uh, below. Okay, government realized this problem, yeah? government realized this problem and uh, there are a lot of uh, discussions happening uh, policy advocacy policy uh, formulations and uh, so on yeah it has happened uh, for a quite while uh, it's around in the past uh, three to uh, five years since the first uh, term of president jokowi the discussions about reforming the uh, energy subsidy including the lpg subsidy has been uh, taking place yeah, and the government always uh, the discussion always uh, focus on two uh, policy alternatives. First is that to keep the existing policy like today, but only limit the consumption of subsidies LPG only for the poor and vulnerable household. Yeah, this has failed. This has failed. There are many, uh, uh, you know, there are many uh, uh, mechanism trying to li limit. Uh, non-poor and vulnerable household to purchase uh, subsidy LPG, but failed. So now the government focus on the second policy alternative, which is, which is to change the subsidy mechanism from price subsidy to direct targeted subsidy to only for poor and vulnerable household. So it has been decided principally uh, by the government, by the parliament, and now the government is in the process of uh, preparing the policy. So this is basically the policy in the making. Yeah, the government uh, uh, 
has decided that it has to be direct targeted subsidy, shifting from price subsidy to direct targeted subsidy. So it means that uh, provide non-cash form to eligible household and families, yeah, so they can uh, purchase the LPG in a discounted price, yeah. But on the other hand, subsidized LPG is to be sold at economical price, yeah. So like the price of non-subsidized LPG to eliminate price disparity. And the next thing is that the government is considering to give a fixed monthly subsidy. So uh, it will be calculated yeah, uh, based on uh, the needs. Yeah, it, has it has been calculated. It will be around 45,000 Indonesian rupiah to 60,000 Indonesian rupiah per month, which is actually enough to uh, you know for a normal uh, use uh, of the family uh, for three uh, cylinders of LPG per month. Okay, uh, this is the work in progress. I'm happy to say the government is working very hard for uh, you know uh, improving the data for targeting, because when we do a direct targeted subsidy, it means that you should know who are the beneficiaries, who are they, where do they live, yeah, what are their bank account, yeah, something like that. So you can transfer the uh, subsidy to uh, the beneficiary. The second is that the mechanism of subsidy disbursement. The government is also uh, working uh, with this. We have been doing some uh, pilot uh, program uh, testing and so on. And there are many alternatives that have been presented to the government. The government also is working with the technology transfer. Uh, there are uh, many alternatives. And one of the alternatives is that to use a facial recognition. So it means that there is no uh, card uh, required. Uh, those who uh, become the beneficiary of the subsidy will be registered, uh, you know, their uh, facial biometric data, and then they can only show up to do the transactions. And of course, the government is working uh, with these supported regulations. This is uh, all a work in progress. There are some delay. Everyone knows why the delay happens because of the pandemic because sometimes the government have to concentrate with the pandemic. As you may know that last month, Indonesia was hit by the uh, Delta variants. Thank God now the case is uh, declining. Uh, so hopefully uh, the government can start to uh, focus uh, with the uh, work in progress in the development of the policy. The parliament has agreed uh, with the policy. And actually the recommendation for the, for the parliament is that this policy should be implemented sometimes in 2022. It has not been uh, divine, whether it is in the uh, early uh, 2022, mid 2022, or uh, end of 2022, but the government has a room in 2022. So hopefully uh, it can happen. But this is just uh, introductions. I would like to, oh, oh, sorry, this is just to give the, the, the idea that uh, the data of the, that the government is working on, the government uh, is uh, trying uh, now to improve the unified database for the database of poor and vulnerable household, or it is called DTKS, DTKS in Indonesia. As you may see that the energy subsidy, including the LPG subsidy, is, is targeted uh, for 40% uh, household, 40% below uh, uh, household. So it means that it will be around 27.2 million households or 29.3 million uh, families. So if the government use this data, it means that there will be a, a, you know, a cut almost half of the total uh, LPG subsidy beneficiaries. At this very moment, there are around 51, 52 million households that receive LPG subsidy. And if this policy happen, it will be only around 27 million households. So it means that the government will cut uh, almost half of the uh, beneficiary of LPG subsidy. So hopefully that those who will be cut is that those who come from the 50% uh, richest uh, group. So this is just to show that the government also working with the uh, G2P system that uh, to be used for the uh, disbursement of LPG subsidy. Yeah, the, the mechanism from the government transfer to bank using saving account, using e-wallet and tran electronic transaction tools, including the fast uh, facial biometric technology, it is uh, under the de development. So uh, this is the most important thing uh, of 
the discussions that I would like to bring in this uh, forum. Yeah. So what do we expect from the policy uh, reform that I explained to you earlier? Basically, we expect to have at least four impact. One is that government budget savings. If we can have government budget savings, then the government can allocate the budget for more productive uh, activities, yeah, productive programs like health, uh, education, of course, development of renewable energy. Yeah, can we achieve with this uh, policy design? Yeah, yes, we can. Yeah, can we uh, achieve reductions of poverty and inequality? With the policy design that I explained to you earlier, yes, we can. Yeah, but we have, we still have a problem with the gender and social inclusion. I'll explain to you that the existing policy uh, in the making will not address gender and social inclusion. How about the promoting the use of alternative energy and support energy transition? Also, will not support. Yeah. I'll give you uh, the explanation in the next slides. Okay, this is just to give you the idea. The first two uh, objective, the first two uh, expected impact, yeah, we can, yes, we can achieve. Yeah, as you may see that, yeah, the existing budget on the blue bar, 49.4 uh, trillion Indonesian rupiah, if we give the uh, subsidy only for family, it means the government only need to spend around 15.8 million. So it means that the government will have 33.6 uh, trillion uh, budget savings. But if the government will be quite generous, giving the subsidy also not only for family, but also for, for small and medium enterprises, farmers and fishermen, the government need 28.7 trillion. But still, the government will need uh, we, we, we will have 20.7 uh, trillion uh, Indonesian rupiah in saving, which the government can reallocate uh, for productive program, health, education, infrastructure, of course, include energy access and renewable energy development. So come back to the previous slides, government budget savings check, we can have it. The second is that projected impact on poverty and equality. Yeah, uh, the Ministry of Finance, they have uh, developed a model, yeah, and it has been concluded that if we do the policy the way I explained to you, yeah, the poverty rate will, it will reduce, yeah, will decline from 9.82%. This is based on the baseline in March 2018 to 9.75%. Uh, 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 will be go down even further 9.50% if we give uh, more subsidy. And also the uh, Gini index, the inequality uh, also will uh, decrease from 0 0.389 to 0 0.388 to 0 or to 0 0.387 if we give more subsidy. So come back to the previous slide. Okay, government budget saving check, poverty and equality reduction check. But how about gender and inclusion and promoting the use of alternative energy? Here is the fact. Okay. I'm saying to you that direct targeted sub subsidy, even though the one that we are now developing, the Indonesian government is now developing, yeah, direct targeted subsidy alone will not solve energy inequality, inequality problem. Yeah, as you may see that, yeah, only 12.28 million poor and vulnerable uh, people have access to LPG and LPG subsidy. So without further policy changes, inequality of access will continue. You see on the right side of the uh, graph. Yeah, energy access for cooking for poor and vulnerable household. Yeah, you see those who have access to existing LPG is only 12.28 million. So it means that, yeah, even uh, the poor and vulnerable household, it, it means that if we change the subsidy mechanism, it means that it only affect the 12.28 million household. It will not give benefit for 12.51 million households who are still using firewood air as their uh, cooking source. It will not affect the 1.94 uh, household that use other sources of energy like briquette, uh, you know, coal briquette, and so on. Yeah, yeah. There, there are still uh, around 500,000 uh, households still use uh, kerosene, which is still subsidized. So 
What I'm trying to say here is that there are entry barrier to the existing LPG and LPG subsidies. Basically, there are three uh, reasons why. First is that they they do not have money to buy LPG gas cylinder and LPG stoves. Yeah, you cannot just buy LPGs. Of course, you need the stoves. Yeah, you need the cylinders. Okay, and the price of cylinders and the price of uh, LPG stoves for uh, poor household is actually relatively expensive. The other thing is that there is no LPG available in the area. Even though they, even though they have money to buy the LPG cylinder, they have money to buy the LPG stove, but no, not uh, there is no LPG available in that area. So it means that they have they cannot access the LPG and also they cannot access the uh, subsidy. Even though they receive the uh, you know the non cash subsidy, still they cannot use that to buy the LPG because LPG not available there. The other reason is that they choose to use other fuels that are more accessible and cheaper, like firewood. So the inequality problem is happening right now. And if we don't solve this problem, even though we change the policy to direct targeted subsidy, there are still more than 12 million households left behind yeah, without uh, modern and clean energy. Yeah, and so disparity, the disparity will still happen. It also happens in the electricity, still the same. You may see that. Yeah. No, thank, thank you, uh, Rudy. I think um, I think we're going to have to draw the presentation to a close. Okay, okay. I, 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 I still have, have to. A... I still Please have to slide. Uh, this is the best thing, uh, actually. Go okay. Ahead. So what I'm trying to discuss here is that uh we still need additional reform to increase equitable access to energy yeah. so this is now that what we are working now yeah we, what we are working now is that to push the government yeah to have a little bit more policy modification what is that one is that we would like to encourage the government to develop a policy that allow the transfer subsidy to buy lpg cylinder lpg stuff and to regulators or to pay installation fee for electricity. This is to address the uh, entry barriers. The second is that if there is no availability of LPG and electricity in the area, yeah, the government has to allow the amount of the subsidy to be used yeah, to access or purchase alternative energy sources that are available locally, including solar, biogas, and so on. So this is uh, the uh, small changes that will create uh, a big uh, impact on the energy transitions and also the inclusion. So with this, yeah, we can check all of the uh, expected uh, impact. Government budget saving, poverty and inequality reduction, gender and social inclusion, promoting of the use of energy alternative and support energy transition. This is just uh, the potential impact. We have done the study. This is just a pre preliminary report. If the government uh, stretch a little bit the policy design by allowing people in remote area who doesn't have access to LPG and electricity to use that, yeah, the amount of money to access uh, locally available uh, renewable energy, the renewable energy mix will increase by 0.021% to 0.0819%, which is quite significant. And the welfare impact, you see, we talk about the welfare impact, we talk about the uh, uh, social inclusion. Number of children attending to school will increase around more than 5 million. Number of job creations will increase around 500,000. Girls attending school will increase around 2.4 million. Job opportunities for women will increase uh, around 400,000. Uh, so by stretching a little bit the policy, it will uh, increase the, be the benefit. So this is the key message. Yeah, uh, This is my last slide, uh, Peter. So there is a huge inequality access to energy subsidy, creating more wealth disparity. Fossil fuel subsidy reform with direct targeted subsidy disbursement alone will not solve the problem of inequality. So better policy design and mechanism are required to address inequality problem, especially to those who have no access to energy, existing energy. Addressing inequality access to energy subsidy is as important as energy transition. So we have to start now solving inequality access to energy. We have to start now. Without it, inequality will remain even in the successful energy transition. 
By that, thank you very much. I end up my presentations. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much, Paru. They're absolutely fascinating and superb. And, and to see all the, the impacts that LPG subsidies have had over the years, you know, the idea starting with the kerosene switch to LPG, but then, as you see in so many countries, the explosion of demand for LPG and that it still doesn't reach all the people you want. So very nuanced picture and really good uh, to hear as well. Your, your further investigations there about how to improve the policy such that it does deal with the inequality aspect as well. So thank you so much. And I'm sure there'll be questions for you going forward. Um, next, I'd like to turn to Tasneem Esop, our, our third speaker for today. She's now the Executive Director of Climate Action Network, and she's an expert in climate change, energy, poverty, and social justice. Climate Energy Network is, is an international network. It's a strong voice for stakeholder engagement um, within energy transition processes. And I think many of you will also know Tasneem from her previous role, where she was, uh, she held various senior government positions in the South African government, including serving as the commissioner in the National Planning Commission of South Africa, uh, where Just Transitions was a major part of that. Uh, she's also worked with um, WWF International and has been a head of delegation at the UNFCCC and also with the board of the Global Call for Climate Action. Um, and we're absolutely delighted to have her with her today because there's, there's very few people who have so much expertise on how social uh, aspects can be brought into energy transitions. And Tasneem, we're really pleased to hear from you today. A um, bit, bit of a reflection as well on on fossil fuel subsidies in particular. So thank you very much for accepting the invitation and, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, and greetings to everybody. Um, let me start out by thanking the organizers for inviting me into a conversation that I think is probably the most important for our times that we're living through. And especially, uh, you know, when we're talking about equitable access, when we're talking about justice, when we're talking about people-centered approaches, I think we're living through times where all of these lessons are being learned as we live through this pandemic, for example. And these lessons are lessons that we should be translating into our actions on climate. And within that, of course, uh, within the lessons for planning, developing and implementing uh, clean energy transitions. The first observation I want to make, uh, Peter, is, you know, um, we really have to, and I think the point has been made uh, by Heather as well, we really can't see clean energy transitions as a standalone transition, right? And so the idea of looking at uh, an energy transition within the, an economy-wide transition is going to be important. And even more importantly, we have to see the energy transition within a society-wide transition. Now, when the IPCC came out with its special report on 1.5 degrees, they were sending a warning that what we're going to require, and I think Brian also speaks to this, is radical transformations of our systems, not just energy, we're talking about our food systems, our the finance systems, industrial systems, etc. With any radical transformation, and at the kind of scale we are talking about, you will not achieve justice if you're not making justice the central feature of your program and plans. And so obviously we already know that the energy transition is happening. What we're not sure about and what we're not clear about guaranteeing is whether those transitions will in fact be just. And when we talk about justice, what are we talking about? Well, the nub of the issue at hand here, of course, and I'm referring to the climate crisis, is that the crisis itself, who, you know, for those who are least responsible, 
for this. And we're talking about it and Radhi's presentation has been extremely um, valuable actually. For those who the crisis will actually, you know, where you will feel the most impacts, the heaviest burdens, they're not responsible for the crisis. It's not the majority of the poor in the world or those living uh, and suffering inequality that has contributed to the crisis. And yet they are going to deal with the burdens of the impact of climate change, but also for the potential adverse effect of any transition. So that is the core of the injustice that we're talking about. And how do we ensure therefore that the transitions are just that the outcome of the transitions are just is, you know, fundamentally going to be including those most vulnerable impacted communities at the decision making tables. It's not, a, you know, something that can be resolved, you know, all these plans in boardrooms of governments or think tanks, et cetera, alone. We certainly need to have those who are at, the, at this point in time excluded from much of the decision-making, they have to be at the tables. They have to be at the tables, not just as a tick in the box exercise, you know, we've heard and we've consulted, but they have to have meaningful participation. And, and so uh, Peter, it was interesting in the slides you presented, when you said, you know, the dialogues that must happen, you featured labor, you featured employers, and you featured government. Now, at the highest level, we know that that is the kind of, this is the kind of guidelines that have been drawn up for these dialogues on just transition. And this is where we fundamentally, as a civil society network, want to say, loud and clear that there is one critical stakeholder that's missing in that. And so you can't talk about justice and you cannot talk about inclusivity if you don't have communities at that table and in those dialogues. And hence civil society more broadly who represent uh, communities, we have to be at the table and communities directly, of course, in, at very local levels where these plans are being made, they have to be at the table. So that's the first point I want to make. You know, don't think that transitions are going to be just without those who are actually suffering the injustice being at the table, the decision-making table. The second issue that I, I, I do want to raise is you know, the injustice uh, that we are experiencing and uh, ensuring equitable access will, of course, especially in the energy transition, and especially when we look at these issues that have been forefronted in the discussion so far about the negative or adverse impacts of fossil fuel subsidy reform, because as you've heard from Heather and then Rudy as well, you know, in many instances, these uh, subsidies have contributed, not addressed, contributed to lessening, um, you know, the experience of poverty in, in many places. Now, that brings in the international justice component. Much of the transition, these energy transitions in order to be just, and in order for a place like Indonesia, for example, to redress this problem, of you know having to look at the reform of LPG gas uh, reform, we would need international financial support from those who can afford it to support the kinds of programs in poorer countries to address that, not the LPG gas reform, but the move to renewable energy faster. It's not, you know, so countries like Indonesia, through this example, will see that they still need to go through these transitions of depending on fossil fuels, whether it's gas, et cetera, whereas we have the ability to roll out at scale. And the IA has 
shown that in its report, and we're very excited about the uh, IEA report, but we can roll out renewable energy much faster if we had the scale of financing to do so. Now imagine, Peter, if we just shifted our mindsets and said, well, you know, we're talking about equi uh, equitable access, we're talking about justice, etc. This, of course, is targeted to those who are bearing the worst brunt of injustice and inequity. If we scaled up renewable energy, is there the potential for example in these communities that Rudy uh, refers to to actually look at decentralized and this is happening in many places renewable energy options for example so the argument Heather that you make uh, you know that we have to afford the opportunities for people to still go through the loop of transitioning via fossil fuels to get to the other end I think a lot of that, and to ensure access and to ensure justice, can be fast forwarded and leapfrogged if there was massive scaled up international support. And that's why I am so excited about your presentation, Peter, where you looked at how these fossil fuel subsidy reforms can actually be redirected towards exactly that. So. I did want to bring in the international dimension of justice. <clears throat> but coming back to um, the inclusion of voices at the table, it, as I said, these radical transformations of economies and societies will, will only be able to be both just, but least disruptive, if there is this massive program of including people in the country about well, the transition, what needs to happen, these are going to be the negative impacts, these are the big trade-offs that we make or will have to make, these are the ways in which we will deal with the adverse effects of it, so that people all understand what the implications of these transitions are. And in addition to that, that people understand why we are actually needing to transition. If that's not clear, and if people are not included in, in, that, in these discussions with you know, uh, good firmed up awareness and information, then we disempower people. There's no doubt that people on the ground, and I've worked in grassroots communities, understand the issues. What they don't have is the capacity and resources to be engaged in, you know, in these difficult discussions on a consistent basis. So another area that we would have to look at is the kind of support to build that capacity of communities to be meaningfully and equitably engaged in these big decisions about their future. So we want a just transition we want an emphasis on the concept of justice in these tr transitions because transitions are happening or it will be forced upon us and we should be proactive and ensure that it's least disruptive and to ensure a just outcome you would need real meaningful inclusion of people women have to be at the table those who are suffering the health impacts and we've had you know really exciting uh, and very, uh, in fact, um, worrying presentations from our, our node in, in, in India, for example, that just shows not just the health impacts, but generally across the board, a number of different impacts that people who live around fossil fuel, um, fossil fuel uh, projects, et cetera, have caused. I want to end off, Peter, and I know that we're running out of time, but I do want to give just a concrete insight into, you know, because we don't, you know, we talk about justice, we talk about inequality, uh, but to bring it to a very localized uh, understanding. I worked in Pumalanga um, on this, when we were doing the just transition work. Um, 
and and Mpumalanga in South Africa is what we call the hot spot of coal in the country. Air pollution in levels that you can't imagine, unemployment, poverty levels at its highest, etc. But it is the center of coal in the country, coal mining, coal-fired power stations, etc. And the communities that we were um, engaging with essentially tell us the story. Because of poverty and unemployment, the only option they have is to go to the mines for employment. So they apply for jobs. And so they pass all the, um, you know, the different levels, and then they come to the medical examination. And they fail the medical examination. Why? Because of respiratory problems. And it's respiratory problems caused by the mines. And then they have no other option, of course. And so they want to look at sustain sustainable livelihood options. So do a bit of small scale farming. The soils are polluted. The water is polluted. And on top of all of that, access to health services for poor communities is also very, very problematic. So, you know, in the end, what we're talking about are people's lived experiences. And if you had them at the tables of these kinds of big decisions about energy transitions, we would then know how we need to prioritize what we're doing, what the impacts are going to be for people and what their solutions are actually, because they presented so many amazing solutions as a community, but they're not being heard. So I'm going to end here, but my fundamental message is, when you present a slide on inclusion and you know dialogue, please do not forget that the millions and millions and millions of people living in impacted communities have to be front and center of those dialogues because that's who we are planning for. And that's whose lives we are wanting to improve. That's my singular message. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you so much, Tasneem, and, and for being so gracious about the slide as well. And I know technically there's there's a discussion about tripartite engagement, and I know tripartite plus is now the, the, the much better way of talking about this, where communities are, are completely involved. So get communities to the table, um, listen to them, no justice if justice is not a central feature, look at international justice as well. Um, and then the whole issue about empowerment of communities are absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Tasneem. I'm sure we have plenty of questions for you coming up. Um, our last intervention today then is from my colleagues at ISD. I think it's um, a recorded message from Shruti Sharma, who's got um, some family responsibilities this evening. She's an India project coordinator for the Global Subsidies Initiative at ISD and our expert on gender dimensions of fossil fuel subsidy reform. We've done an awful lot of work on that, particularly in India. So if we could load that one up, Jonas, and let's listen to Shruti. I'm grateful to the organizers for inviting me today. Thank you to all the participants for joining. I will share findings from India's experiences with LPG subsidies, reform and their gendered impact. I hope this will be a useful starting point to discuss how to integrate gender in supporting a people-centered clean energy transition. Now in these slides, my two main messages are that fossil fuel subsidy reforms have gender differentiated impacts and that the removal of subsidies for lighting or cooking fuels can negatively impact women's lives. But fossil fuel subsidy reform is also a significant opportunity for clean energy access goals when it is designed in a way to safeguard women's access to clean household fuels. Um, a little bit of context here. So historically, India always universally subsidized LPG as 90% of it was used for cooking. This made LPG subsidies India's biggest policy for addressing clean cooking, and it also made it the single largest petroleum subsidy. Now to control subsidy expenditure, there was a low oil price opportunity in May 2020 last year that allowed uh, the subsidized price, price to match the market price and consumption subsidies were canceled in that moment. This means that currently LPG subsidies are only offered for LPG take up, which is a connection subsidy. 
Now, this connection subsidy was um, started in 2016. It's called PMUI or Ujwala, and it supports upfront costs like the deposit for the first cylinder, LPG cooking stove, associated equipment with it, along with the interest free loan. So let's take a look at what are the gendered impacts of LPG use. Now, on these slides, I share numbers which quantify the impact of LPG use in women's lives related to their time savings, treasury, and health. It's based on primary survey that we conducted in 2017 among 810 households in both rural and urban areas in two districts with very high levels of poverty and low LPG use at that time. So some of the findings are also from secondary data from national um, statistical databases that record energy and gender. Overall, we observed that using LPG generated time savings for women on average, women saved an hour per day due to reduced cooking and cleaning time. This meant women had more time to spend on other activities like leisure, spending time with their children, watching TV, or reading the newspaper. LPG use, even if it was used in combination with biomass, reduced the drudgery of collecting and preparing biomass, a task which is often undertaken by women and girls. In terms of health, compared to biomass, LPG is smokeless, so it did not create any lung and eye diseases. We also observed two other spillover benefits from LPG use. The first is that LPG use empowered men to cook, means, means male of the household was cooking, willing to cook. If LPG was available, this allowed women to travel and leave the house. And secondly, it allowed women access to identity documentation and financial services. It meant opening up a bank account, access to a mobile phone, and a national identity number called Aadhaar. Now, India has a long history of undertaking different reforms for LPG subsidies, and there has been tremendous policy movement on this. On this slide, I'm listing some key reforms that have been introduced since 2014. It began with a consumption subsidy called DBTL or Pahal, which is a, a bank cash transfer that was introduced in 2014, and then followed up with a connection subsidy called Ujwala that I spoke of earlier. It was introduced in 2016. Now, for both of these policies, several targeting policies have been introduced, but we find these targeting approaches have seen limited benefits. We found overall poor targeting of LPG subsidies to the poorest, and we undertook research of how well these subsidies reached poor households in Jharkhand, a state with high poverty levels. We took a representative sample of both urban um, and rural households, divided them into quintiles, where each quintile represented 20% of the population, and ordered them from poor to well off. We found LPG subsidies are regressively distributed. For both urban and rural households, we found the richest two quintiles received more than half of the LPG subsidy benefits, and the poorest two quintiles on the left of each figure received less than one third. So a quick recap. Firstly, we know that LPG subsidies, um, LPG use actually dramatically improves women's lives. Secondly, we know we also found that LPG subsidies don't reach the poorest as well as they should. So in this slide, I talk about the danger of removing subsidies. When we asked women in the primary health survey conducted in 2017, what if we LPG subsidies are removed, most households said that they would like to continue using LPG by either reducing consumption of other goods or fuel stacking. Now, reducing consumption goods in whatever form it may take, whether that be the quality of food grains, reducing protein intake, reducing education or health expenditure, all of these negatively impact household welfare. So subsidy reform, particularly LPG subsidies, needs to be undertaken with care and to avoid negative energy access impacts on household and on women's lives. So where is India currently in terms of LPG subsidies and improving clean cooking access for women? It's a bit glass half empty situation. Um, currently, LPG subsidies are only offered, like I said, for uptake of LPG, the connection subsidy. So poor women are targeted to acquire LPG, but continued use of LPG through consumption subsidies is missing for these women which is a setback for the household and particularly for poor women. So we recommend consumption subsidies should be redesigned and reintroduced that they only target women from poor households, which are the Ujwala or the connection subsidy beneficiaries. Also, LPG subsidies don't work in isolation. For clean cooking, we need a host of supporting activities like improving education and alternative clean cooking options like electric cooking, biogas, clean cook stoves, and other renewable op options that can compete with LPG. With that, I finish my slides. Thank you for your time. My colleague Chris will be available for questions. 
A virtual thank you to Shruti and her colleague Chris Clean is online for questions there. Um, so um, again, I think reinforcing there the messages about LPG, uh, about some of the benefits that those bring, and also suggesting, uh, along as Pai Rudy was saying earlier, that some of the targeting um, can be better, including in this case to poor women in particular. Um, for LPG subsidy. So we've got some time for discussion. I've been following the questions on the Q&A here on Zoom and also what's coming in um, from the, the Twitter uh, live stream and from the, the, the wider handle. And I think there's sort of, two, there's really sort of two main categories to the questions we've got. Um, one is really saying, how do we bring those who are impacted to the table? Um, this is very much along the lines of what Tasneem was um, stressing in her presentation. And the second one, I think, is you know, what do we do if clean energy um, alternatives are not currently available for particular communities or part of uh, or parts of the society or parts of the economy? So maybe I could turn to you first, Heather. Um, I know it's been a while since we had your presentation. Thank you for your um, patience. Um, you know, what, what do you think about, is there any sort of further advice you've got on bringing impacted communities to the table from, from the work you've been doing at WHO and, and your observations from health communities uh, more widely? Thanks. Well, it's a very interesting. I just want to give my compliments to all the presenters. This is quite a very um, robust discussion and much needed. Um, and I would really like to just build up on Tasneem's presentation, in fact. I think one of the critical things to, to ensuring this clean energy transition is really impacting people is making sure that it's tailored to the particular population and the needs of the country. In, in many places, you know, we do need to target those populations that really need it. We need to combine it with pop behavior change campaigns. We need to make sure that what we're promoting is something that they're actually going to use and something that can be taken up. I know in the India example, for example, they, she had mentioned they've done many years, they've been trying to, to give cleaner biomass stoves and these things, and even the LPG cylinders, now that they're not getting the subsidy for the refill, will probably end up just sitting as a, as a shelf or something. So we really need to tailor the particular reform with strategies to make sure they're really hitting those populations with something that they can use that's affordable and that's something that they want to do longer term. And there is a lot of innovations and it does require a whole bunch of solutions. The LPG, for example, is not just one thing. It does require improvements and efficiencies. I know that there's fantastic uh, um, achievements made, for example, in pressure cookers to help reduce the, the energy demand of electric cooking, for example, which have been very successful. So, the, you know, we need to be looking at different strategies, not only just about the fuel technology itself, but also things related to um, the behavior change, what types of fuels and technologies can be used, what are the pop what are the impacts on their local population, how is this, if you do, for example, decide to, 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 you know, uh, put a new power, a new type of power plant there, make sure that you look at how this is impacting the local population, or, or, and how we can actually improve those situations. Thank you, Heather, and, and you know, we've, we've spoken a lot today about, I think, some of the exceptions where um, fossil fuels are useful, you know, particularly in LPG and electricity, so sort of modern fuels where we're looking at replacements for traditional fuel, the indoor environment. I mean, do, do you have any, have you done work at WHO that says, you know, fossil fuel subsidies to coal are bad, but LPG could be good? Have, have you done any sort of um, disaggregation there amongst the sort of types? Well, it all depends on the particular level, right? If we're talking about fossil fuel generation, we haven't done a thorough analysis, but indeed we're definitely against coal, for example, because we have synthesized the evidence and the coal combustion leads to adverse impacts. We actually we actually have recommendations specifically on the indoor as well against the use of unprocessed coal. So I think it depends on, on, on what level you're looking. Um, and so indeed, in, in some cases, there should be this idea that you know we don't need fossil fuels. We should get rid of them for those cases where electric cars may do well. And we have some other form of producing electricity nearby. So it, it really is a balance um, based on the context, the needs of the population, and needs to be really articulated for, for that particular context and that local local population. Thanks, Heather. Um, and maybe I could turn to you, uh, Parudi. You spoke a lot about LPG, um, and it was it absolutely fascinating. Great to hear all the analysis and the considerations about reforming the policy and making it better and so on. Um, could I ask you the, the same question I just asked Heather? You know, are there, do you within Indonesia have a sort of 
set of fossil fuel subsidies that you think you must get rid of whatever, you know, coal or transport or whatever, and then some that you think are possibly worth retaining, you know, given targeting and the context and so on. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Yeah, uh, in Indonesia, as I explained to you, that, that, that uh, there is three main uh, fuel subsidy for fuel, LPG, and electricity. Uh, myself, uh, we focus on the uh, household base subsidy, which means the uh, electricity and LPG. Yeah, of course, we provide in, uh, input for the uh, improvement of the uh, fuel subsidy, but we understand that the purpose of uh, fuel subsidy uh, is basically for transportation and logistics. So it is a bit more difficult to, uh, to target, yeah? because uh, what the government expects from the uh, fuel subsidy is basically to uh, you know, reduce the uh, logistic and transportation uh, price. So that's why we focus on two uh, major uh, subsidy, which is the uh, LPG and electricity subsidy. But these two alone actually uh, uh, have very huge impact. I mentioned to you that uh, almost 50 trillion Indonesian rupiah, um, the LPG subsidy and the uh, electricity subsidy is even more. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. around 50, uh, you know, uh, seven Indonesian uh, trillion Indonesian rupiah. So these two subsidy alone, so it totally around 100 uh, trillion. In addition to that, Indonesian government they have uh, you know the so-called uh, hidden subsidy yeah because in the nomenclature we the, the budget nomenclature we call it subsidy for the lpg subsidy and electricity subsidy but actually there is a there is a there is so-called compensation compensation which means that the government pay the uh, difference between the actual production price of the uh, electricity yeah, and the price uh, that the state electricity uh, uh, company charges to its customer, and this is around 27 Indonesian, uh, uh, 27 trillion Indonesian rupiah, and most of the beneficiaries are richer group. So uh, what basically we are uh, the government is discussing. Yeah, is these two things. One is that to reduce the compensation. The second is that to make sure that these two types of uh, household-based uh, energy subsidy, the LPG and electricity, can be uh, targeted. Yeah. So uh, if you ask about the targeting itself, yeah, the main, the biggest challenge in the discussions of uh, direct targeted subsidy is that the targeting itself is that the data, uh, the beneficiary data. Yeah, the second is that the uh, mechanism, the transfer of mechanism. But I'm happy to say that actually Indonesian government uh, have been uh, quite, uh, ex uh, have a generous experience in delivering targeted uh, social assistance. Yeah, back in 2005, 2008, 2013 and 14, uh, the fuel subsidy reform which give impact to the poor and vulnerable household is compensated is compensated by the uh, uh, direct cash, uh, cash transfer. So the government is trying to look the same uh, mechanism, the same uh, data for uh, that. That's my answer. Hmm. Thank you so much, Parida. I know it's very late in Indonesia and you have to move to another engagement as well. So thank you so much for your participation today. We've, we've... Hugely You're benefited. Welcome. From thank, it. You, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very you much, Peter. Thank you. Um, Tasneem, as well, you, you spoke a lot about um, the need to bring communities to the table. Um, and we would, I'd love to hear a little bit more about any sort of, you know, if we're looking towards now the Global Commission on People Centered Transitions, making some recommendations and some of those being about fossil fuel subsidies or, or having a link to them. Um, you know, what what specifically would you would you like to see in those recommendations that we could could put in to make things as sort of practical and as just as possible? Well, I think I've made the the point. You know, I mean, it would be important for especially governments at national level when implementing 
their plans for these transitions, that they, a policy recommendation should be that they should ensure that communities are at those, are part of the processes and at those tables. And that in turn, they should also support communities to be able to do so. That's the one thing I would add. Mm -hmm. Could I though, Peter, you know, this thing about uh, the LPG gas story and this is transition fuel, etc. cetera. Yeah. Is, is, I, I want to just say that it's, you know, recognizing that there are, of course, local conditions that we have to consider and what we apply as a solution should take all of that into account. But, you know, we're not having an energy transition in the absence of the bigger global climate emergency. And the recent IPCC Working Group 1 report is very clear about sending those alarm bells we, uh, you know, the IA report has also made their findings. Um, and so, you know, the window of opportunity to slow down this crisis is narrowing. And so, you know, yes, we do have to have these transitions that are managed and just, etc. But we're also having to look at this at a, a time scale that isn't, uh, you know, giving us the, the opportunity to be absolutely um you know um yeah to be to be able to move that quickly so so we really have to think about the urgency of this if communities for example knew that there's a trade off here that you know here's these mm. we need to address poverty and inequality through still using a fossil fuel based um, subsidies etc but if communities understood that the trade off for them is this immediate relief versus the implications of what fossil fuels are doing to the climate and hence the unbelievable suffering sustained over time of what a climate impact will mean for them. So again, just completely undoing any poverty or inequality measures that are being taken. So I think we have to keep this in perspective and not um, you know, I think I'd, I'd be nervous about messages that go out that says, you know, recognizing the negative and adverse impacts and we should allow for more, you know, we should be clear we have these solutions, they are clean, and if we had the finances at scale and that could come through yeah. redirecting fossil fuel subsidies, then is that not a better option to be exploring with urgency? Uh, that's a superb point and, and very well made. And I think you know, today perhaps we we focused a bit on some of the specific cases where uh, fossil fuels can have a benefit to to certain communities, but there are so many where they don't. You know, where you know, anything to do with coal from its production to all the way to its use in industry or in, in the household or or in buildings, um, transport fuels, uh, just the vast quantity of subsidies. You know, in, in our view from ISD uh, would be they should be reformed because they act against sustainable development, not for it. There are some specific cases, and perhaps we've spoken today more about some of those specific cases, but I think the point you're making here, Tanzanian, about you know, the perfect cannot be the enemy of the good. Um, there are very urgent challenges that need to be dealt with um, very, very soon. Thank you. Um, I think that takes us to the end. I think we've covered the sort of the broad range of questions that we had. So I'd now like to turn back to, to Brian Motherway. Brian, thank you very much for um, staying patient with us all today and, and listening to the whole um, debate. I hope it's been helpful. Um, always a hard challenge to try and um, provide some closing and some summary remarks, but, but over to you. Thank you, Peter. And um, first of all, let me say thank you and congratulations for pulling together such a great set of speakers. It's been really fascinating. And I must say very uplifting to listen to all the speakers and, and, and thanks to you and obviously to Heather and Pa Rudy and Tasneem and of course Shruti, it, it's been really informative for me and my colleagues who've, who've been listening attentively and taking notes. And as I said at the start, we will share all of this information uh, with the members of the Global Commission and their teams. And I know they'll be very interested in this. I mean, I don't want to try and summarize everything, Peter, but let me just pick up on, on the closing conversation you had there with, with Tasneem, which is we've got to act quickly. We, we, there's plenty we know about. We don't need to know everything to the nth decimal place, place to get started. There's so much 
available technologies. Uh, uh, there's so many available solutions and so many well-proven policies. And I'm talking across the board in clean energy, not just in fossil fuel subsidy reform. But, but subsidy reform exemplifies, I think, the wider questions we're facing here, which is there are complex interplays between some of the social and economic goals and the clean energy goals. There's some good practice out there, there's some bad practice, um, but we need to be ultra sensitive to the political delicacy of these issues. We need not to think of this as just pure theory and that there's one answer that, 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 that fits all and there's one way of doing this. We also need not to demonize practices that exist or are, have existed uh, that are addressing uh, myriad social and economic imperatives and trying to balance things in a very complex way. We've heard some good discussions about those complexities here today. Having said all that, we need to act and we need to act quickly. And we know plenty about good practice. We know plenty about good design that can allow us to act quickly. Uh, we can do this in sensitive ways that, that combines goals well, and we've heard some very good examples of that, uh, whether it's the kind of careful design that Indonesia is thinking about or the importance of the health factors and, and really focusing on that. And of course, uh, the many well-made points about the involvement of communities, looking at particular factors such as uh, gender impacts. I think uh, it's clear to me today from this discussion that we, we have a, a real wealth of knowledge and expertise. And I must say, commitment to these issues that, that, that we can draw upon and that governments around the world can draw upon. If I could just close with just a thought on, on picking up from Tasney's point about, I'll paraphrase you Tasney, and forgive me if I get this wrong, but you kind of said that clean energy transitions are going to happen. It's a question of whether they're just or not. And, and I think that first, uh, let, let me give my own personal view on this. First of all, we need not to forget that why are we doing clean energy transitions? We're doing it to make people's quality of life better. We're doing it to save people from the ravages of climate change. We're doing it to improve energy access, to improve air pollution in cities, to produce, improve access to the good things that energy can bring to our lives. It's all about people. So for me, it makes no sense to think about uh, a definition of a clean energy transition that isn't about people. Um, you know, and I think there, there is a risk that we start down that path. I think we see some technocratic thinking. We see some focuses that are very narrow uh, along the line that Tasneem is warning us about. But I, I don't think they'll get very far. I think we, we've seen we've seen how quickly uh, doing things badly can 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 cause a negative reaction. We see how important communicating change here is, designing you know uh, subtle. Uh, policy for, to protect uh, vulnerable groups, uh, and of course, responding to the needs of different parts of the community and to the mul multiple goals we have here. So in an ironic way, I'm optimistic because I don't think we can do this in an unjust way for very long. We just, it simply won't succeed. For me, a core part of the definition of clean energy transitions is to be people-centered. And that's certainly what we would encourage to give them governments to think about is that, that when they think about the core definition of clean energy transition, that just transition, job creation, protection of communities, inclusiveness, gender equity, participation, acceptance are all core parts of that definition. And if you start from that point, we know there's a wealth of learning around the world uh, to understand how to do policies that will fit with that definition and that will maximize your likelihood of meeting those goals and being successful. That's what the Global Commission is all about. So today has been really great to hear these perspectives. We're, we remain keen to hear from all of you. So please do get in touch with further views or ideas and please do watch out for the recommendations of the Global Commission when they come in a few weeks time. And of course, that will only be the beginning of the dialogue. We look forward to staying in touch with all of you, uh, all of the speakers today, all of the people listening in. This will be a discussion I know we're having for a very long time. So Peter, thanks again for hosting and for sharing. It's been great to participate. Thank you. Brian, thank you for, for your very kind and um, very to the point um, summary. Uh, not much to add from, from my side at all. Uh, it's, it's great that the, the Global Commission is looking for these sort of examples that you're putting clean energy transition, associating it so closely with people-centered issues as well. And I think the other thing I'd pick up with is, is the wealth of learning. You know, we, we heard from two countries today about LPG reform and, and some of the issues and the problems there. A lot of these problems and solutions are generic. Of course, they have um, 
context specific issues to them, but large parts of them are generic. So I think there's a, a good, good possibility here to bring forward some specific examples that, that can be helpful um, worldwide about how to how best to do things. Um, only remains for me, thank you, Brian, and for IEA for all your assistance today um, and for opening and, and closing so well. And to government of Denmark for putting this forward and, and making sure that the Global Commission on People Centered Clean Energy Transitions had a fossil fuel subsidy component to it. It's obviously an important part of, of the move and can either act to help if we reform or to hinder our move to clean energy transition. And then mostly today to our speakers for their time and for their expertise. Tasneem Esop, now with Can International. Um, thank you so much. Heather Adair Rohani with the World Health Organization. Wonderful to hear the engagement of the health community. And then my colleagues, Chris Beaton and Shruti Sharma, uh, working on India and in, in, gender, in, in gender issues. And then last but not least, Parudi Gobel from uh, the poverty reduction part of the government of Indonesia and all the great work they've been done. So thank you everybody for your participation. Thanks for everyone who raised questions and participated today. And please uh, take this forward take forward this conversation as you can, um, including um, with Brian and with his IEA colleagues. So please uh, don't feel shy to, to forward them or to us and we could forward things on. So thank you all. And I'm very pleased um, with the webinar today and thank you all and speak soon.